In this video, we're going to discuss pathways and pathway problems. You know those big things that just look like alphabet soup? There's acronyms everywhere and relationship words that string them together? That's what we're going to learn how to tackle today. Now, when we first approach a pathway, it can be really tempting to go ahead, dive right in, and try and understand everything that the passage is telling you. And I really want you to resist that temptation. We want to instead focus on the big picture. What exactly is this pathway describing? Don't worry about getting all the details. We'll do that later when a question actually asks about it, because if a question doesn't ask, then why put in extra work? For example, we have this pathway here. It says that hippo is a protein kinase implicated in the development of cancers. Under normal circumstances, hippo phosphorylates the protein kinase warts, causing it to phosphorylate Yorkie, which subsequently leads to Yorkie's protosomal degradation. If Yorkie isn't phosphorylated, it binds to scallop, forming the Yorkie scallop complex. This complex then localizes to the nucleus, where it increases the expression of several target genes, including cyclin E, which promotes cell cycle progression in cactus, which which activates other transcription factors. Now, if you didn't understand everything that was being described, that's totally fine, but hopefully you can realize that this is a pathway because we get a lot of those acronyms strung together by action verbs, such as phosphorylates. For our first read-through, we would just want to capture what were they describing? Well, apparently they're telling us about hippo and the development of cancers. Presumably this is just describing the process by which these cancers develop, but we don't want to worry about all the details. When we get the question, we'll go ahead and figure that out. So in this case, my only highlights here would be hippo and development of cancers. That way I'll be able to jump back to this quite easily. Since we end up skipping charting out our pathway until we actually get a question on it, we need to be able to figure out what a pathway question looks like and how to identify them. And we're going to contrast two different types of questions that are about the pathway, but only one of them actually requires the whole charting process. I'm going to break this up into what I call pathway questions and fact-based questions. So pathway questions are often going to involve multiple elements of the pathway. So multiple acronyms will often show up. And in addition to multiple acronyms, you're often going to see relationship words like increases, decreases, upregulates, downregulates. And we're going to see that here in this particular question where it says an activator of WTS would result in an increase in which of the following. And then we get things like cell cycle progression the amount of SD in the nucleus, the levels of cactus transcripts, and YKA ubiquination. It's talking about multiple parts of the pathway, so we're probably going to need to chart it out and figure out exactly what's going on. This is in contrast to the fact-based question, which says SD would be most likely to contain which of the following, a signal sequence, cadherins, DNA binding region, or a promoter. For the fact-based question, we only need to pinpoint a specific piece of information. We don't need to chart everything out because we're not describing the relationships. Realistically, all we need to know is what the heck is SD, and as a result of that, what would it contain? Let's go ahead and dive into this question so you can see how the approach will ultimately differ from how we attack pathways a little bit later in this video. When we go back to our passage for a fact-based question, we're really looking to highlight that minimal amount of information that gives us what we need. So this has to be about SD and probably something about its features or maybe what it does. When I go back, I get this piece that says it was forming the YKI SD complex, and this complex then localizes to the nucleus where it increases the expression of several target genes. The way that this is described, especially when it describes going to the nucleus as well as increasing increasing the expression of several target genes makes me think that this is a transcription factor. So I would expect to find this somewhere in the nucleus and interacting with DNA. It probably wouldn't have a signal sequence then because signal sequences tell things to be excreted from the cell or at least go to the plasma membrane. Cadherins involve the junctions between cells and that's not really relevant because junctions don't happen between the nuclei of two cells. A DNA binding region sounds really tempting because it would need to bind to DNA, therefore C is the right answer. And D, a promoter, doesn't make any sense because presumably if this is binding to DNA, especially if it's a transcription factor, which are proteins, it's not DNA. Only DNA has promoters, therefore we wouldn't expect SD to have a promoter itself. Now, let's go ahead and review that pathway question so we can see why we actually need to chart things out. We can't just pinpoint that one specific piece of information. When we read this question here, the first thing that we get is it's an activator of WTS. So we're already messing with the pathway and how it works, and we didn't do that in the previous question. Then it asks, this would result in an increase in which of the following. It's basically saying, hey, if we change this one part of the pathway, how does the other part of the pathway change? And then it mentions things in the pathway. Cell cycle progression, the amount of SD, the levels of cactus, and then YKA ubiquination. When it comes to charting the passage, we could scattershot and chart absolutely everything out, but this really isn't that efficient. Instead, we're going to focus on the things that were mentioned in the answer or the question stem itself, rather than charting out the entire pathway. So in this particular question, we want to make sure that we include WTS, cell cycle progression, SD, cactus, and YKI, and figure out what the heck is going on with that ubiquination piece. To do this, we want to focus on specific keywords. And when I describe keywords, I'm really talking about key verbs. These are the verbs that bind everything together and define the relationships that occur between different parts of the pathway. So for example, as we read through here, it says HPO phosphorylates. So that's saying that HPO has this particular relationship with WTS, specifically one of phosphorylation. When we go down a little bit further, we see this exact same relationship pop up when it says that warts is going to phosphorylate Yorkie. This is then going to lead it to YK's protein 
lysosomal degradation. So I'm often looking for things like phosphorylate, leads, forms, localizes, changes in location, or some sort of change, whether it's in shape, property, etc. From there, I would then begin to pick out and make sure that as I go through and I chart this individually, I'm including things that are mentioned in my answer choices. So if they talk about where cell cycle progression and WTS are related, I would include that. Same thing about the SD is specifically in the nucleus and cactus transcripts, as well as ubiquination. Sometimes this is going to take content information in the instance of D, since it doesn't directly mention YKI. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Let's go ahead and actually start this charting out process to begin with. So here it starts. Hippo is is a protein kinase implicated in the development of cancers. That's irrelevant. We don't actually care about hippo. That's not where we're starting. It says under normal circumstances, hippo phosphorylates the protein kinase warts. Okay, so in this particular case here, we don't really care about hippo phosphorylation because again, that's not where our pathway starts. So we'll just start with warts because that's where we're jumping in. That's WTS. What does it do? It says it phosphorylates Yorkie. So we'll go ahead and draw this arrow between these two. So presumably if we activated or upregulated WTS, we would also upregulate the amount of Yorkie that is phosphorylated. Well, what does this lead to or what does this cause? It says this subsequently leads to YKA's proteasomal degradation. So we'll draw an arrow with another up arrow to YKA degrade. From here, we probably have our correct answer if we're able to connect D, ubiquination, with proteasomal degradation. Ubiquination is simply just a tag that says, hey, go to the proteasome, go get degraded. So it would make sense that if we activate WTS, that leads to an increase in the amount of proteasomal degradation that we should also see more YKAI that's ubiquinated. But let's say that you were a little bit confused about ubiquination and you didn't know how to connect those two pieces together. That's actually okay. If you find yourself a little bit lost, try charting out the rest of the pathway and see if you can find where the rest of the answer choices are showing up and by process of elimination, get to the correct answer. So let's go ahead and do that. And this is an interesting case where we have a split. We can tell that we have a split here because it says if YKI isn't phosphorylated, but previously they told us about a situation where YKI was phosphorylated. In this instance, you have a couple of different options. You could draw this as a branch or you could draw it as a separate pathway. I'm going to draw it as a branch. That's my personal preference, but there's not a right or a wrong here. You pick what works best for you. So what does it say? It says, if YKI isn't phosphorylated, it binds to scallop forming the YKSD complex. So then I would just draw an arrow that says YKI, and I'll say without P for without phosphorylation, and this is going to lead to an increase in the SD YKI complex. What happens next? It says this complex localizes to the nucleus where it increases. I'm going to stop there. I'm stopping here because it all of a sudden tells me about the nucleus and that's in my answer choices. Rather than writing another arrow that then says goes to the nucleus, I'm just going to go ahead and put a nucleus underneath the WKI SD complex. So that way I know that those two ideas are ultimately attached to one another. From there, we'll continue on, and now it says that it increases the expression of several target genes, including cyclin E, which promotes cell cycle progression. Again, I'm going to go ahead and stop. I want to include cyclin E since it's connected with the idea of cell cycle progression. So again, I would draw an arrow from YKI SD complex to cyclin E with an up arrow so that I know that we're increasing that, and then below it, I'm going to go ahead and just put CC progression. And that's just, again, for cell cycle progression so that I know if I increase that previous thing, that I'd also increase that as well. It also says and cactus, which lets me know that it's also increasing the expression of cactus too. So I could just put a little plus and an up arrow with cactus, and then that says that it activates other transcription factors. And I don't really care about that information because as I look through my answer choices, they never talked about the activation of transcription factors. So it's irrelevant, but they did talk about cactus, so we would include it in this particular instance. As we step back here for a moment, we can see that if we were to activate WTS, we presumably wouldn't get YKI without the phosphorylation, which means that all of those other answer choices, cell cycle progression, the amount of SD in the nucleus, and the levels of cactus transcripts would be downregulated or decreased. And therefore, we would know that those are the wrong answer, and we could get that D is the correct answer. Now, let's say that you were just completely lost on this particular question altogether, and you're saying, oh my goodness, I don't even know how to interpret the activator of WTS and that kind of thing, but you were we're able to create the flowchart. Go ahead and just take a step back and look at the flowchart. Especially when we have a split like this, if you can see that one thing is going to lead to another. So for example, we can see that if we have the YKI and SD in the nucleus, that leads to cell cycle progression and that also leads to an increase in cactus. All three of those particular concepts are tied together. We can't have three right answers, so all of those answer choices must be incorrect. But on a second branch, we have the YKI stuff going on. So there's a really good chance that D is the correct answer because it just doesn't fit with the rest of the pathway. This isn't a foolproof approach and it could lead you astray in certain circumstances, but it's a lot better than guessing, so it's worth a shot if you're totally lost.
In summary, today we learned about pathway problems as well as pathways and how to handle them. And our approach is to treat it like it's any other passage. We're just going to go ahead and read through and not get caught up on the details, pick a big picture highlight, and we're going to worry about it when we actually get a question that's asked about it. We need to be able to distinguish between pathway and fact-based questions. And to do this for pathway questions, we want to look for things that talk about increasing or decreasing the pathway in some sort of way. In addition to that, you want to see multiple elements of the pathway popping up. This is in contrast with fact-based questions that usually don't involve increasing or decreasing different elements of the pathway. And furthermore, they usually don't involve multiple pieces of the pathway either. If we do have a pathway question, we're going to worry about flowcharting it out. And we're not just taking that scattershot approach, but we're making sure that we're cross-referencing with our question stem and our answer choices, and only including the things that are actually relevant to answering the question in front of us. This is more efficient, and it also makes sure that we don't miss anything as we're going through. If you're a little bit lost, you can always take a step back and say, well, what follows from what? So for example, if you have three different parts of a pathway that are all connected and one that doesn't seem connected at all, there's a really good chance that that disconnected piece is the correct answer, while the three pieces that go together are going to be the incorrect answers. And again, that's just because we can't have three right answers, so all of those things must be incorrect in the context of this question. And that sums up our approach for pathways and pathway problems. If you like this video, go ahead and leave a like down below or comment. Tell me what else you'd like to see and share the video with anybody else who might be taking the test.